My hope and my prayer is for you this morning that you can truly say the words of that song, I'm a child of God. We live in still the greatest nation in the world, a nation in which was founded upon Christian principles, whether our higher-ups believe that or not, founded upon religious liberty, religious freedom, founded upon the Word of God. A sad statement, it's a sad statement when we look at our nation and we see the place from where we've come and the place that we've arrived at. And I'm afraid that a lot of this is due to a lackadaisical attitude in the church to the point that it has begun to, and we've seen, we see this, I know that many of you have listen to other preachers looking for a good preacher, a good message. But we see this on television, through televangelists and all that, and we've, if you really get down to the nuts and bolts of the matter, you understand that a lot of those guys are preaching a false gospel. They're preaching a prosperity gospel, a, a plant of seed, if you will, leading people to believe that if they'll just do a certain thing or act a certain way or dress a certain way, then ultimately they'll be able to enter into heaven's gates. Titled my message this morning, by the way, is a false gospel. We talked, uh, I gave a sermon last week entitled The Authentic Gospel, how it comes from an authentic source who is an authentic God and he has an authentic purpose. This morning we're going to be looking at Galatians in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul in Galatians in chapter 2. Shared with you last week, I had, had uh, begun to read a book entitled Free Indeed by Dr. Ken Hemphill, and it's kind of led me into a deeper study of Galatians, and so I want us to look at Galatians in chapter 2. Over the last year or so, there's been uh, several coin phrases that have been adopted in our nation, and one of those coin phrases is fake news. Fake news. Anybody heard anything about any fake news over the last year or two? Okay. I've got a slide up there, Shelby, if you'll just uh, advance that for me. There we go. It seems as if we've had a fake news invasion. Not only so in the political realm of our nation, but also in the, in the circle of churches in, all across the world. A fake news invasion. As I said, I've entitled the message, The False Gospel. We're going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Galatians. It says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that that gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain, But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, I want you to pay special attention to verses 4 and 5, and I'm going to put them up on the screen for you. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, we're going to continue on down to verse 9. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they seem to be somewhat in conference, adding nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me Barnabas that we should go forth, or should go unto the heathen, or Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. And I uh, paraphrase that word, heathen, with Gentiles. And if you have different translation, modern translation of the scripture, you'll see that that is properly so. Now, let me kind of bring you up to date, and for those of you that have been coming on Wednesday nights, the Wednesday night Bible study, 
we see where Paul ultimately had preached at Damascus and they sought to kill him. He came up to Jerusalem and they sought to kill him. And from that point forward, the apostles, that is those disciples, they sent him back to Tarsus where he was from. And for a period of 14 years, for a period of 14 years, Paul's ministry basically remained quiet. We have no record of exactly what was going on other than we know that he was preaching to the Gentiles where he'd confronted the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's now gone and he's begun to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. As he comes back to Jerusalem, and there's been several different ideas as to the time frame, but we look over in Acts in chapter 9, we see where he ultimately left Jerusalem the first time. He's come back to, back to, he comes back to Jerusalem. I'll get, I'm trying not to lose this piece of peppermint. Just warning all you people sitting on the front row. Actually, it's very small now. How many of you, how, you stick a piece of hard candy in your mouth and you just can't help but bite on it? Yeah. All right, it's gone now. You're safe. He comes back to Jerusalem and he makes it clear here that he goes before Peter. He goes before John. And he goes before James, that is, the Lord's brother James, who uh, was not an apostle, but he now has become one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church. He does not come to these three to get, their, to get their approval for the gospel that he preached. He simply comes to confirm what they have already heard, confirm the reports. If you remember Barnabas, Barnabas was one of the ones in Acts who had a piece of property. Many believe it was the same Barnabas, uh, whose name also was Joseph or Joseph. He sold a piece of property, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas had become a, intertwined with the apostles in the ministry of the gospel. Barnabas also was one of whom, when they had heard how the people at Antioch had been converted, Barnabas was one who they sent to take a report, to see if those things that they had heard were in fact true. And so we find in Galatians in chapter 2, Paul making reference to Barnabas, and we find in Acts we find elsewhere in the scripture, Barnabas continually working with the apostles, and primarily he takes Paul on. Not only does he defend Paul before those apostles who are at Jerusalem, but he also takes, takes Paul, if you, if you will, under his wing, and he and Paul, they partner together and go out to all the churches. And they make, Barnabas was the one that went on Paul with his first missionary journey. We find also another reference to Titus. Titus came to Jerusalem with Paul. Titus was a Gentile. Titus saw no need because he'd received the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saw no need in regards to being circumcised. So we learn that the issue at hand is that there are those of the circumcision who have come and they've entered into the church. Paul says that they have come in privately. They've come in as spies to seek out the liberty which they were celebrating. These were those who wanted to lay on top of the gospel of Jesus Christ the burden of circumcision. Now, I want you to consider this for just, the, for just a minute. Grace is the most important concept that is ever taught in the Bible. Grace is simply being defined as an un, the unmerited, unearned love and favor of God. The Bible says it's for by grace through faith are you saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But grace means that God has given you not what you've earned, not what you have worked for, not because of who you are, but rather because of who he is. And we find the word grace used in the New Testament in two different senses. Now they're both related, but first of all, it re refers to the gracious disposition in God which moves him to love us freely without our merit and bestow his blessing upon us even though we are undeserving. But it also means that that power which this grace bestows upon us to work in us. 
And if you go and you look at verse 9 of chapter 2, he says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace, or perceived the grace that was given unto me, that Paul is talking about not only his effectual calling to salvation on the road to Damascus, but also the work for which he is commissioned. If you remember in Acts, for those of you that have been studying Acts with me, Paul told Ananias that, or God told Ananias that Saul, now Paul, is a chosen vessel unto him. Why was that? Because God saw through the persecutor Paul. God called the sinner Saul. And he called him to the ministry of the grace of Jesus Christ. And we find Paul often using that word grace in reference to his own salvation and calling. We find other places in the Bible where it talks about grace. John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, John, John the Apostle, records for us the words of John the Baptist in reference to Jesus in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1. Where it says, This was he who, of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, speaking of the pre-incarnation of Christ, and of his fullness have all, <coughs> excuse me, have all we received, and grace for grace. Now John's basis for making that statement and making that reference of, to grace comes back to verse 14 of John in chapter 1, where it says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld this, His glory, and the, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, in light of the context of the Scripture in the second chapter of Galatians, Paul speaks about these spies who have infiltrated the New Testament church in an attempt to overtake the message of grace. Dr. Ken Hemphill poses the question in his book, Free Indeed. He says, can a person be saved by grace alone through faith alone, or must some human achievement be added? You see, that is the question that we must answer today. Is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, enough? Does it or does it require other outside influence? Does it require certain obediences? Or do you have to be baptized, for instance? Now, I'm a firm believer in baptism. I think upon the point of salvation that a person should desire to be baptized. That is the person who's truly experienced God's grace, his unmerited favor, and his desires to be obedient to the example that Christ has left for us. But salvation can only be by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't ever let someone mislead you into believing that there is something that you must add in order to be saved. You see, in the example of the church at Galatia, which Paul was writing to, there's been a little bit of controversy as to when he wrote the book of Galatians. But he, he refers to those who were rooted in false doctrine. These were those that we go back to verses 4 and 5. These were those people who had infiltrated the church privately. These were those who were attempting to insert legalism, insert legalism into the doctrine of grace. We find in the, in the Bible, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find an Old Covenant in the Old Testament. We find the New Covenant in the New Testament. The Old Covenant had to do with the circumcision. And if you remember the story of Abram, who would later be called Abraham, it was a sign of the covenant that God had made between Abraham and himself, that man would be circumcised. It was a sign that that person who bore that circumcision was a child of God. 
But when Christ came, he instituted the new covenant. The covenant which comes by grace through faith. And we find grace also in the Old Testament. But we learn that Christ didn't come to destroy the law. As a matter of fact, we find him making that statement. But rather he came to fulfill the law. And the New Testament covenant, even though the the phrase covenant of grace is not found in Scripture, it is a correct expression of the truth that it teaches. That the contrast between the two covenants is none other than that of law and of grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans in chapter 5, in verse 20, he says this, The law came in that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did abound more exceedingly. But where sin abounded, grace did abound more exceedingly. In Romans in chapter 6, in verse 14, Paul says this, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And so we understand that in regards to the New Testament, the New Covenant, that there is no room for legalism, in regards to salvation. These men also came in, tried to infiltrate the church with the idea of many traditions, the traditions of men. And let's face it, it's human nature to come up with thoughts and plans. And in in Baptist churches, we like to establish them as being biblical. Unfortunately, a lot of good ideas turn into empty traditions which when looked at in light of God's Word, they have nothing to do with salvation or the Scripture. You've heard me, if you've been attending this church for any time whatsoever, you, you've heard me make the statement that, you know, there are a lot of things as Baptists that we do that are biblical, and then there are those things which we do that are extra-biblical. We cannot imply that those things that are not in Scripture are necessary for salvation because if we do we are no better than the false brethren who infiltrated the church and tried to overtake the message of Jesus Christ the second thing that I want us to consider not only Not only was it rooted in false doctrine, but Paul makes it very clear that it was propagated by false brethren. Here it is, these people, they came, they infiltrated the church, they mixed and they mingled. And to look at these people or to look at these men, many would say, well, you know what, oh, so-and-so, they're a member of the church. Or, oh, so-and-so, boy, they sure have been faithful lately. Paul warned Timothy, the young Timothy, of these false teachers, these false preachers. He warned Timothy that in the last days, and I like what he says in 2 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 1, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he begins to break down and describe what mankind was going to look like. Does this sound familiar? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, broasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy-minded, or he- heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, or pleasures more than lovers of God. And he goes on to say in verses 5 through 7, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He says, from such turn away. Now, he's, remember, he's speaking to the young Timothy. He's already encouraged Timothy to stir up that gift which was within him, which was first with his grandmother and his mother. He goes on to tell young Timothy in 2 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust. They creep in unaware. 
In verse 7, he says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, these false brethren had come and propagated their own gospel. But they had been sent to spy. They'd crept in unaware. And by creeping in unaware, they were able to deceive perhaps many and to lead them astray. We know at one point in the Gospels, or not in the Gospels, but in the New Testament, we find where there was such controversy, even amongst Peter and Paul. Peter had allowed the outside influence to infiltrate the church. And evidently he'd begin to listen you know, I've always heard that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. He'd begun to listen to some of those outsiders coming in, and Peter being a Jew, it would have been natural for him to accept those traditions and laws in regards to the old covenant. And so we finally see them going head to head, of which old strong, hard-headed Peter finally gives in. But Peter had been led into that deception. And I want you to know this, notice that Paul refers to these false brethren, that they've come in, they've propagated this false gospel. He says that they seek to bring us into bondage. In verse 4. He says, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us in to bondage. My friend, let me tell you something. We sang that song free indeed, Don. I, I appreciate that song. I didn't look at the song list that Don had picked out this week. But when you're in Christ, when you are in Christ... You're dead to sin. When you are in Christ, you have that Christian freedom, that Christian liberty. It's not a liberty that leads one to go out and habitually sin, but it's a liberty in knowing that God has paid for your sins, that Jesus Christ shed His blood for a purpose. Don't allow those who would pervert the gospel of Jesus to bring you into bondage once again. I like the way that Paul puts it in Romans in chapter 6. I want to turn over there real quickly and read just a couple of verses to you. I often quote these verses upon someone's baptism. Where it says in Romans in chapter 6 and verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall also live with him. Now, I often quote verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him in baptism unto death. And we're risen to walk in the newness of life. Our friend, don't allow anyone to creep in unaware. And to pervert the pure, authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you do, you need to understand that they are attempting to pull you back into that old life that Christ has brought you out from. So what does all this equal to? Well, these false doctrines which are propagated by false Brethren, ultimately lead to a rejection of grace through faith. That is the gospel of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Remember, it's all about what he did on Calvary's cross. Not about what you can do to get to heaven. When our Lord came down from heaven, he left his heavenly home. The Bible makes it very clear. He came to this earth fashioned as a man. In other words, he was born as a man. He was in the flesh. He was tempted as you and I are. As the Spirit led him away into the wilderness for 40 days. And yet he did not give in to temptation. He lived a sinless life all the days of his life until he was crucified on the cross. <clears throat> and then he took the sin of the whole world upon his shoulders. And he shed his precious blood. The Bible tells us that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took him down from the cross and put him in Joseph's tomb. Three days would go by and nothing. But upon the first day of the week, upon the first day of the week, that stone would be rolled away and Jesus would walk out alive. For 40 days, he would appear to well over 500 people. We know at one point he appeared to 500. For 40 days, he would walk this earth once again as a man. For 40 days, he would encourage the apostles, the disciples, to wait until they be endued with power from on high. But that power could not come unless he went back to his heavenly Father. And so he ascended into heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, as we call it in Acts, the book of Acts, we find that the Holy Spirit fell upon those men. And they began to preach to different nations and languages. And those people began to hear the gospel of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the true gospel. Aside and separate from any laws of man or any traditions that had been established. And they found it to be the saving gospel. Jesus himself said before he went to the cross... I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto my Father but by me. If you, don't, if you leave here this morning and don't get anything else, please grasp this point. The only way to get to heaven... It's by God's grace, through our faith, in His Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus cried out, and we have several, several of the Gospels record different things, or report different things that Jesus said while up on the cross. But we find one of the phrases, one of the statements that Jesus makes is this, It is finished. Jesus' sacrifice for our sins would be complete upon his death. The Bible goes on to say in that gospel, and he gave up the ghost. Jesus' shedding of blood is a reference to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. When he says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall become white as snow. When you accept the grace of God through your faith in the sacrifice of God upon the cross, the payment is made for your sins. His blood covers your sins. And you make Him Lord of your life. You see, Jesus is Lord anyway. He's Lord whether we acknowledge it or not. But by our acknowledgement, He becomes Lord of our life. 
and our name is written down in heaven. And we become a child of God. That's the simple truth. It's a simple truth. So I want to ask you this morning as we close. Do you know my Lord and my Savior? And does he know you? There's an old hymn that we sing, and I'm not going to sing all these. I'm not going to sing it, Don. I'm just going to read it. If you want to read along with me, you're welcome to. I believe it's hymn number 344 in the celebration hymnal. It was in the Baptist. It's in 300 and something hymnals, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Grace greater than our sin. The first verse goes something like this. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. The second verse. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Freely bestowed on all who believe. All who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? And then the chorus. If you'd like to sing it with me. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. My friend, if Jesus is speaking to your heart, He's calling you into His matchless grace, how will you respond this morning? Christian friend, you know, a lot of times we allow Satan to creep in unaware and to deceive us into believing that some practice or tradition that we have always done for all of our lives is necessary for salvation. And we begin to teach and we begin to preach and we begin to tell people that it's necessary for them to enter into eternal life. I want to challenge you to weigh your tradition against the Word of God. To weigh your practice against the Word of God. And if it ain't there, drop it. Drop it. Paul heard the words of Jesus when on three different occasions Paul prayed to the Lord to remove a certain thorn in the flesh. Jesus' words to him were simply this, King James Version. My grace is sufficient. That word sufficient means enough. It means enough. Let's stand together as our music team comes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. We thank you that it's infinite. It's matchless. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord, who died upon the cross to... Give us an example of your grace. Lord, that we through faith in his finished work might receive it. Lord, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word. Let us, as we go about to teach and to preach and to testify of your love, let us be found faithful in your word. Lord, forgive me where I fail you, Lord, and at this time we simply pray your will be done in the lives of those who are present, those who will be watching this afternoon, this week.
Forgive me where I fail you in Jesus' name. Amen. God's speaking to your heart this morning. I want to invite you to come forward. If you never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you simply come and have a seat on the front row? Allow me to share more about what it means to be saved.